Good day and welcome to Galaxy Surfactants Limited Q3 9th month FI23 earnings conference call. This conference call may, be, may contain forward-looking statements about the company which are based on the beliefs, opinions and expectations of the company as on date of this call. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involves risk and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star, then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. We have with us Mr. Unnatan Shekhar, Promoter, Managing Director, Mr. Natarajan K. Krishnan, Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Abhijit Damle, Chief Financial Officer from Galaxy Suffolk Limited. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Unnatan Shekhar. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all once again for our quarter three FY23 conference call. Before we get into details, it is important for all of us to understand the journey, the story that has played out over the last 18 months. It was exactly a year back when we had reported one of our weakest quarters. This had come on the back of another weak quarter which saw your company report its first volume decline. Questions were being asked on the inherent strength of our business model. And though we remained confident, we knew only our actions and performance could reimpose and reassure our investors. As American author Robert Collier once said, success is a sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. In that galaxy, we have practiced and demonstrated the same over decades now. It has been the small and consistent efforts put in by our team day in and day out that has ensured that we report our best quarter till day in terms of operational profitability and record the best calendar year in Galaxy's history. Truly a remarkable turnaround when compared to our performance 12 months ago, given the highly volatile macro backdrop. It is important that to understand the context here because on one side, we are in inflationary as well as a deflationary backdrop. And on the other, we had significant demand cutbacks and deteriorating economies. But despite the multifold challenges, we have consistently grown and achieved our FY22 profit in the first nine months of FY23. The consistency demonstrated by the team is worthy of praise. And I take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank them for the same. While numbers are lag indicators, one of the lead indicators is the equation we share with our customers. It gives me immense pleasure to share with you all that we recently received the Clean Future Partner Award from Unilever. This award was only given to six suppliers globally who have partnered with Unilever and through multiple innovations, enabled them in their journey towards a cleaner future. As it is said, success is a journey and not a destination. And for us, the journey of innovation, partnering with purpose, with all our stakeholders, and delivering consistent performance continues. The inherent business model remains robust, and in a strong talent pipeline, we remain positive, confident, and optimistic of a brighter future. Moving on to the business performance, it is important that we understand the structure and drivers as well as the short-term factors influencing it. India continues to remain a bright spot for us. While the volumes have grown 12% in Q3 and 7.7% for the nine months till December, the bigger picture is what pleases us. Today, we are on course to cross the 100,000 metric ton sales number for India. The same stood at 69,261 metric tons in FI18, thus growing at 8% CAGR over the past five years. Based on this performance, we can safely conclude that the structural uptick we witnessed during COVID has not only sustained, but as inflationary pressures ease, we can expect further buildup in momentum. I would urge you all to look at the bigger picture, which remains bright and healthy. The Africa Middle East Turkey region has been a point of concern. 
while volumes have declined 14.8% till December and 6% for the quarter, it is a macroeconomic volatility that is a point of concern. This year has seen the Egyptian pound depreciate by 100% compared to December 21 and the Turkish lira by 71%. While the lira seems to have stabilized, the Egyptian pound in the last one month has further depreciated by 25%. As our performance in India shows, a stable macroeconomic environment is a precursor to growth. Stability ensures growth, and it is this stability that has ensured that on one hand we have India crossing the 100,000 metric ton mark annually, and on the other, Amit recording its lowest volumes since FY17. On an aggregate level, as well as for the past three years, our volumes have remained flat, mainly due to the slowdown in MIT. Nearly 10% of the volume decline on an aggregate level has been contributed by the MIT markets, which has in turn been recouped by the growing India market, thus ensuring we remain flat on an aggregate level. But like it is said, there is always light at the end of the tunnel. This quarter has seen AMET grow 11% sequentially, with the bulk of the growth coming from the local Egypt market. While it would be prudent to observe for one more quarter, barring for any other currency depreciation, we do remain hopeful that the worst is behind us. Volume momentum in AMET should make a comeback, and we remain optimistic about FY24. The rest of the world has been a mixed bag for us. The last four years have seen multifold challenges of varying magnitude. While in FI 20 and 21, our volumes got impacted due to the pandemic. FI 22, supply chain issues further compounded the situation. As supply side factors started improving, the contraction of demand in Europe and China this year adversely impacted our performance. While the challenges continue, we do see our performance improving significantly in FI 24. The optimism, is, the optimism is based on consumption making a strong comeback in Europe and developed markets warding off a recession. This in turn will aid our specialties which decline 9% in this year, in this quarter, and 5.6% YTD. Before we move on to the outlook, it is important to understand the nuances of our operation performance, which has been the best till date in this quarter. While multiple initiatives are being carried out in terms of product mix, operational improvements, or judicious price calls to capitalize on emerging opportunities, we need to acknowledge that the decline in volumes as well as reversal of multiple supply rate factors have also contributed towards this performance. While some of these efficiencies will continue in the coming year, but for ensuring sustainable growth, volumes will be the key. While inflationary pressures have impacted the mass and the mass deep segments, thus impacting our performance products, easing inflationary pressure will ensure volume growth, which will eventually result in correction of our EBITDA per metric ton as and when the same happens. This will particularly be true as the Africa, Middle East, Turkey volumes recover. The recovery in Europe and China will aid our specialty volumes, thus ensuring volume growth for each of the segments. While the magnitude of recovery and period within which the same happens remains to be seen, we remain confident of complying with our cardinal principles that govern our business growth, which are volume growth of 6 to 8%, EBITDA growth being higher than volume growth, and PAT growth being higher than EBITDA growth, with return on capital employed in the 22% zone. The structural framework that has enabled our growth over decades remains the same, and the volumes are an integral part of it. Therefore, while we specifically would refrain from giving out an EBITDA per metric ton guidance for FY24, it is safe to assume that your company will aspire to grow in terms of volumes as well as EBITDA for the coming year. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, it is said that success in business is all about building, building relationships, talent pipelines, great products, and robust processes consistently and passionately. At Galaxy, we have done that for the past four decades, and the ensuring decades will be no different. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. 
Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Should I go ahead with the questions? Yes, yeah, please. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question comes from the line of Sanjay Jain from ICIC Securities. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I got a couple of them. Uh, one on your cardinal rule of 6 to 8 percent volume growth uh, followed by higher EBITDA and then um, uh, even better pad growth. Now, considering that we are at an EBITDA per kg of close to 26, 27 rupees uh, and a volume growth of 6, 8 percent, uh, so if we want to comply with this growth where EBITDA normalizes, the volume growth requires to be significantly higher and the contraction in the EBITDA requires to be significantly lower. How should one see uh, this in a very near term? I, I, I can agree with you on a longer term that this may be established, and we have done it for the last 20 odd years. But uh, for, say, next one to two years, how should we see this uh, framework working for us? That's my first question. Uh, Sanjesh, in any case, as far as the last nine months is concerned, we need to understand that uh, some of this EBITDA per metric ton contribution has come from certain export benefits incentives which we received, uh, which were accumulated for a previous period in uh, Egypt. Uh, it was quite uh, significant uh, as far as uh, uh, the last uh, year, they, they know these nine months were concerned because they were of the order of approximately maybe 20 crores or so. Okay. So that has been a, a, a very important inflow. Uh, we have also had uh, uh, certain, you know, sourcing gains which came uh, particularly because of a steep reversal in terms of uh, uh, raw materials uh, during this particular period. And uh, furthermore, uh, as far as uh, uh, the freight rates, which uh, were very adverse in uh, the same time last year, uh, you know, those. Uh, uh, you know, with, with improvement in supply chain, those particular, uh, you know, we had a, a, you know, a reverse, uh, a reversal of those reversals. Okay. So these are the sort of significant contributors as far as the data for Metricton is concerned, as far as this uh, quarter is concerned. So, uh, you know, over a period of time, what we have done in terms of uh, improvement of data is, of course, uh, uh, focused on some significant mix uh, uh, as far as our uh, entire product portfolio is concerned. And uh, again, uh, you know, chosen uh, customers very, very carefully in the regions, in the various regions that we operate. Now, we remain uh, optimistic uh, about, uh, we want to remain optimistic about our volume growth, despite the various inflationary and deprivationary situations that we are experiencing in various parts of the world. Uh, we would like to remain optimistic as far as our volume growth is concerned. And uh, yes, you uh, know, for us, uh, that particular cardinal uh, principle of EBITDA growth being higher than volume growth is, is a, a guiding, uh, you know, principle which uh, we would like to, you know, ad, you know, not only adhere to, follow, but about, uh, even even surpass that. Now that's it, uh, Sanjeev. Fair enough. So this 20 crore benefit in Egypt is for this quarter or is for the nine months FY23? It was for a previous period. <laughs> Because as we know, we don't uh, book uh, any export benefit volume still, it is realized. Okay, that is a policy that we have followed, which we have communicated many times before. No, no, sir, that is fairly understood. This 20 crore is being booked for this quarter per se or for the nine months? Basically, we booked it on a cash basis. And it was booked in this quarter. It was booked in this quarter. And what is the same number for the nine months? I think more or less everything I think came only this uh, this quarter only. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, my second question is volume growth. I I do appreciate that you have a six to eight percent volume growth, but considering a sequential eleven percent growth in the EMAT region, and from next quarter onwards we will be on a much favorable base. 
do you think next year could be an exceptional year where we are normalizing for the last two to three years decline in the MX? That's number one. Number two, can Turkey become an incremental challenge for us on the given the situation in Turkey remains very fragile? Uh, how, how do you see the MAT in a lens where Turkey is there? And number three, are we doing anything for a longer term protection of this volatility in MAT or, or we have to live with it considering uh, that's how those markets behave? Uh, these are my three questions on the volume. Yes, yeah, Andres. Natarajan, yeah. Good morning. Hi, sir. Good morning. So, see, with regard to Ahmed, if you see in terms of uh, local Egypt volumes, we are seeing uh, things are getting better. So, we need to wait for uh, one more quarter to know that it sustains. But that is really a good this thing. Despite the steep 100% inflation, we are able to see uh, things are getting better. Now, Turkey, unfortunately, Turkey was uh, also adjusting to the inflation uh, of almost 70 percent, but this earthquake uh, uh, has uh, thrown things off guard. Uh, but yes, as of now, our only uh, this thing is to see that our customers and their families are safe. Uh, we probably have a better idea probably in the next 15 days as to whether we see any impact, because uh, more than uh, the demand, I think it's how do you reach the supply, so we are assessing that. So I, okay. I, it would be too early for us to make a comment on that. With regard to the entire uh, uh, Ahmed volumes, uh, uh, Egypt, as I said, is getting better. Okay, and only thing is that what I can surmise is that with inflationary pressures uh, uh, coming down, both in terms of commodity and food price, and we also see with the winter going up, the energy inflation also is going to be much better. So it only augurs well, okay, for uh, the volume growth to happen pretty well. So I think this, this I can conclude safely that the worst is behind us as the Ahmed volume seconds. No, that's fair enough, Nitrogen. But I'm just thinking you can FY24 be a year where we normalize all the last two years of uh, decline where we can recoup and market is also coming back. What are our customers telling in terms of their market share? Because I think they have lost a significant market share in the local market. Yeah, correct. So customers are also... Uh, they probably also saying that things over well for them in terms of the prices getting now corrected. They do hope, they do expect that things should start uh, getting better. So what I'm saying is a reflection of what my customers share with me. You got it, got it. Thank you. My last question is on the competition. Uh, one on a general competition within India where we have seen few uh, surfactant companies like RT have been uh, coming back, and number two on the phenocytanol, I think Rosari is. Uh, talking of ex of expanding their footprint in the export market, how do we see uh, competitive intensity coming out of India base? So we have been, uh, Sanjay, as you know, that in the last 40 decades, we have uh, uh, seen and uh, managed uh, a huge amount of competition. So this is uh, nothing new. I don't see this as uh, uh, anything of great significance. So we know how to uh, compete, and that's important. And I hope that the market allows everyone to grow, but uh, uh, certainly we know how to manage competition. So we remain confident of maintaining and improving our market share, right? Yes, yes, of course, of course. Okay, got it. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, best of luck for the coming quarters. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question comes on the line of Rohan Gupta from Nuama. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. Once again, congratulations on such a strong set of numbers. Uh, sir, the question may be a little bit extension of the previous answer which you gave the previous participant. Uh, Shekhar, sir, if I heard you rightly, that you said that definitely EBITDA margins per ton this year, nine months, have been uh, phenomenally high, benefiting from the <clears throat> multiple factors and uh, product mix and also the uh, export benefit. But I think that you are still, uh, though you didn't give any guidance on margins per ton, but if I heard you rightly, you said that we are still looking at absolute EBITDA growth next year. Am I right, sir, on that front? No, no, the EBITDA per ton certainly, as our cardinal, as our cardinal principle says, we could be ahead of the volume growth. That is what our striving will be. Okay. So, uh, if I extrapolate that, uh, it means that we are still looking uh, uh, EBITDA margins per ton um, next year. 
will be much above than what you used to give earlier guidance of 16 to 18,000 rupees per ton. Uh, yeah, if we are know, still looking at uh, 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 what I would like you to note is that this particular EBITDA pattern is in terms of a certain uh, uh, proportion of performance and speciality. Okay? So, when the performance uh, and speciality uh, percentages normalize, okay, then we would, we would again see, but in the individual uh, categories, uh, the, our, our striving will be to grow the EBITDA per ton at a higher rate with, you know, with the volume growth rate. Okay? But the overall growth rate is a mix of uh, both uh, uh, specialty contributions as well as performance contributions. But fair enough, uh, uh, come whatever uh, permutation combinations we apply, I mean, in terms of the change in the product mix, we understand that this nine months have been tapped in terms of volume growth for specialty. Uh, and going forward, probably that uh, the certain time business will drive the volume growth uh, that that we fairly understand. But it's still, sir, volume growth in a certain time business and given the sticky nature of our business, it cannot be 30 40 percent in terms of the volume growth. So, the volume growth has to be in a certain percentage range of maybe just 8 percent to 12 percent kind of uh, mm. growth in absolute volume. Mm. Also, we will see the price led decline in terms of the uh, because of the softening raw material prices mm. so uh, so probably a revenue growth which we may be looking probably for fy24 mm. maybe as modest as maybe a flat mm. uh, with that uh, top line growth what i am just concerned that if we are not able to protect our EBITDA margins for turn and uh, uh, with a certain weakness mm. probably we should be seeing a declining EBITDA, absolute EBITDA should be declining in FY24. Uh, that's what our uh, numbers suggest. So, but uh, on the contrary, you still look at growing EBITDA. So that's uh, something which uh, not able to comprehend. Uh, Rohan, I'll answer this, Natarajan here. So I, I don't know that uh, how we have, what number, how we have worked it out. But I can tell you uh, in a simple way, how do we look at uh, business? First is, it is clear that the only way to sustainably grow your business is to ensure that you grow your volumes out of the market. That's very clear. In situations, and if you see, till the time that the volume, global macroeconomic headwinds uh, resulted in a negative growth in volumes, we were actually growing our volumes pretty significantly out of the market. And even this year, we are. Okay. But whenever the, we see that the volume growth is not going to be an opportunity, in the, in the volume growth is not going to be available. In fact, it's going to degrow. We need to then smartly manage our operational, our operations, okay, our product mix and our pricing. And we want to do because ultimate aim is to deliver profitable growth. Now, when my volumes degrow, how do I deliver a better EBITDA growth is what we look at. Now, when the volumes, when we do see that there are good signs for us to start growing our volumes, then we need to ensure, okay, that we need to prioritize our uh, entire strategy in terms of getting the volumes back and participate fully in the volume growth. So this will result because finally EBITDA permitting is only resultant of that. But we are very clear that we will continue to grow our EBITDA, you know, near EBITDA as well as but what the volume growth is only something what the market will allow us. But we would want to ensure that grow our EBITDA year on year, okay, to ensure that we deliver on a profitable growth. Fine enough, sir. So uh, it should also be implied that whenever the market picks up significantly and there is an opportunity to gain market share in terms of volume growth, uh, you may offer a, uh, some price discounts to the customers to gain even slightly higher volume growth. Will that be the scenario? Yeah, that depends on the case to case. And obviously, yes, that typically is what we'll do because if the volumes are going to come back, that's what even the customers will do, correct? Go on. They will start reducing price only when they say that it's going to result in volume growth. When they do that, and they typically any businessman will operate, and that's what we will also do. Right, sir. Uh, so just second question is on our, uh, we have always mentioned that uh, our ROC profile, generally we look at is 22% plus before looking any project. But historically, we have seen in last three to four years, our margin profile have improved significantly in terms of absolute EBITDA per ton. Uh, that used to be roughly 13,000 and now we are almost at 18 to 20,000 on a generalized basis or normalized basis right now, so definitely it's very high. Uh, I don't see that there would have been any significant increase in 
asset turn or capex cost that have gone up so significantly except that maybe some marginal increase should we assume and uh, that the roc profile of the company in last 4 to 5 years has also improved and now the project which we undertake is uh, uh, on about 22% on maybe what it was earlier, but now it is roughly 26 to 20, 27% if you look at the current margin. Uh, ROC continue, will continue to be at, uh, uh, the threshold will continue to be at 20, 22%. Yeah, so uh, Ron, it's like this. We are very clear in the way that we direction the efforts to deliver uh, uh, weighted average ROC of 22%, but how we look at individual projects are very different. Okay, so our this thing is to deliver 22%, that's how we work on. Now, depending on how, uh, you know, depending on project-wise, product-wise, the thresholds are very different. But we'll be delivering. So typically, you can have times when the ROC can be delivered as some, somebody lower, but it will always be with the very clear thing of delivering a better average cost of return capital employed of 22%. The third question, if I am allowed, and if there is a long queue, I can come back in queue again. So, uh, in terms of volume growth guidance, I know it's a volatile market scenario and the recession fear in a global market. But still, you see that with the falling raw material prices, I mean, inflation is easing now. Uh, what kind of volume growth or, or just simple market share or market growth you can anticipate over the next couple of years? Can it be significantly higher than last four to five years average, which we used to guide six to eight percent? Can it be in a 15 to 18 percent volume growth range over the next couple of years. No, we would be we would be happy if that happens. Certainly, we look forward to what, to that happening. But yes, it's I don't think uh, that we would be able to hazard any guess on what the volume growth will be with the inflationary correction happening. We want we are very clear that our this thing is deliver six to eight percent in line with the way the market grows. Now, if the market grows by 10 percent, we need to grow ahead of that. If the market grows only by 4 percent, we need to grow ahead of that. That's the way it is. Now, how it will the current uh, price reductions will start resulting in volume, we need to wait and watch, uh, Rohan. I'd not be able to hazard any guess on that. Thanks, sir. Also, thank you very much for answering all the questions. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to all the participants that you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question comes from the line of Rohit Nagaraj from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, sir, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. And again, congrats on good self numbers. Uh, so first question is, uh, last time we had alluded that uh, the inventories at customer end were higher. Uh, what is the scenario that we are experiencing now uh, across uh, our operating geographies? Thank you. Yeah, so we do see that uh, uh, I think the inventory reductions uh, in uh, many of the markets other than U.S. U.S. typically, I think there is still some amount of uh, correction that is expected. That's what our customers tell us. Okay, otherwise, I think in most of the other geographies, I think there, there is no inventory corrections to be done uh, uh, furthermore. It's only in the U.S., as I said, we expect uh, some more to happen because the pipeline inventory is still not got correct. Hello. 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 Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Did, you, did you hear my response, Rohit? Uh, sorry, sorry, I just got, you know, uh, there was some disturbance. What is that, boss? We, except for U.S., where we are uh, informed by our customers that there is some, still some amount of inventory corrections to be done, okay, in the uh, in the trade. Uh, whereas in all the other geographies, they say things have got uh, uh, the inventory corrections have been done. Sure, sure, that's helpful. Uh, the second question is again. Uh, I mean, uh, apologies for hopping on again on the EBITDA per metric ton, uh, EBITDA per metric ton, you know, uh, figure. So uh, you alluded that uh, there was a 20 crore uh, one time in back from the Egypt. Uh, now, a uh, couple of questions to this. Uh, is this recurring in future as well? That is one part. And second part, in uh, first nine months, uh, what was any other one time uh, benefit that we have received beyond this 20 crore? Uh, because of which uh, the number which is close to about 25,000 uh, Mega EBITDA per metric ton for nine months uh, is, you know, probably inflated. Thank you. 
So other than this uh, export incentive that we received, there has been no other significant uh, one-time uh, nine months in nine months. In quarter was 20, but in nine months, how much was? Nine months, it would be somewhere around I think 23, 24 crores. Okay. Yeah. So I think you heard it. Yes, 23, 24 crores for the nine months. Yes. Right. And uh, will this be occurring in future as well, right? I mean, whenever we book the volume. That's why we, we, that's the reason, because there's uncertainty, we account it on cash basis, because it's only when uh, the government releases the money that we can, when they will release is uh, anybody's guess. Okay, so that's why. So they can, we can, we can make any statement on what will be next quarter or six months, next six months. Sure, sure. That, that's very clear. Thank you so much. I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Dhruv Muchal from HDFC Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so the question is again coming back to the EBITDA per ton or per kg. Uh, you mentioned uh, part of the reason is because of the product mix. Uh, some of the products are uh, so based depending upon the product mix. But sir, if I look at the uh, the gap between the performance, the growth in the performance products and the specialty products, the share of performance products has increased in the last uh, say this quarter or the last nine months. So, uh, based on your, uh, is it fair to then conclude that uh, the uh, the uh, EBITDA per kg that you earn on the performance product is probably higher than the specialty products? No, 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 no. no, no. See, what I can tell you is that uh, is that even within performance products, okay, there are products and uh, certain uh, segments where we are able to uh, manage better realizations depending on how the market. Uh, allows us an opportunity. Okay, so it's always the case where the specialty uh, is higher in terms of EBITDA per metric ton. Okay, but even within performance, there are times that where we are able to get better pricing, and that's what we have been able to do over the last uh, nine to twelve months. Okay, so because otherwise this does not give up uh, a clear picture is because. Um, if the share of performance has increased and EBITDA per ton has increased, on, a, on an overall basis, it seems your EBITDA per ton on, uh, uh, EBITDA per kg on the performance product is better. Uh, based on what your commentary is, that uh, it is the product mix which is uh, partly driving this EBITDA per kg increase. Product mix within performance, product mix even within specialty. Okay. So even within specialty, there are certain products where we have been able to get, uh, they have been positioned well uh, in terms of better realizations. So it's a combination of all this. Okay. Okay. And uh, okay. And is there also also uh, if I look at your MNC share has increased. Your 51% it was last year. YTD it is now 56%. Uh, some of the other regional and uh, local levels have declined. Uh, earlier we used to think the MNCs have a better marketing power, so the uh, so the uh, uh, so the probably the bit upper kg will be lower there. But that seems not to be the case. I don't think you can draw any such correlation. Okay. okay. Not, not but one thing is that it is important that what this company should conclude from this is that the sort of strength of the relationship that we have. And obviously, in this market situation, you'd see that only the big players have been able to take out the inflation and are able to grow. So that actually is a demonstration of the sort of uh, uh, the business model that we have, the sound business model that we have. Sure, sir. Got it. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. All the Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Sri Krishna Swanti from GM Financials. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Please go ahead. The line of uh, Sri Krishna has been disconnected. Uh, we'll go for the next participant, and that is Mr. Mr. C. A. Garvit Goel from Investor Search. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, am I audible? Can you be a bit louder, please? Yes. Ah, uh, yes, yes, sure. Uh, now is it okay? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes, sir. So most of my questions have been answered. Uh, just one thing: uh, whether your nine month EBITDA per metric ton is, uh, uh, is sustainable in FY24. Uh, you mentioned uh, it is uh, around 23 CR uh, because of export incentive. So if we exclude that impact, then also it is around uh, 23,700 per ton. So can we achieve this uh, this 23,700 uh, number in FY24, sir? No, that's what we said. You know, this EBITDA per metric ton is only. 
uh, final uh, result of what uh, the way that we conduct our business. So that's what I explained. Now, whenever the the first priority, business priority is to ensure that we grow our volumes ahead of the market. If the market doesn't allow you to grow your volumes because of the macroeconomic headwinds, then we need to see how we manage the profitability because finally our objective is to deliver profitable growth. But delivering volume growth is priority. So if the market now starts offering me opportunity to enhance volumes after the, you know, when the prices start correcting and the consumer demand starts coming back, we will then start prioritizing uh, growing our uh, volumes. And then the EBITDA per metric will be different. So how it will pan out, we are not able to say. That's precisely why we are not able to give you a guidance on EBITDA per metric then. But what we said very, what Shaker said very clearly in his address is that we will grow our volumes ahead of the market and we will also grow our EBITDA ahead of our volume growth and our PAC ahead of the EBITDA growth. So that tells us as to how we are structuring the way that we do our business. Okay, uh, that's, that's all for my question. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes on the line of Bobby J. Raman from Falcon. Please go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, hello. Uh, compared to the last quarter, your volumes barely grew. Then how did you uh, achieve growth and realization? The overall revenues, how did they grow? Can you repeat your question? I couldn't hear you properly. Can you please repeat your question? Yeah, the year-on-year -year volume growth for this quarter was flat. So how did you achieve your revenue growth, given a falling RM environment? See, the revenue growth is, uh, uh, you know, is a, uh, it has a correspondence to the raw material prices. Yeah, so raw material prices start correcting, but then we also need to know that they, they'll be, it always corrects with a lag of three to five months. Okay, so there'll still be some... Uh, uh, pricing that have been done based on the raw material price that was three to five months back. So you would not see an immediate uh, correction, you know, correlation between raw material price coming down and the revenue uh, growth uh, uh, getting impacted. So you will see that Jan, Feb, March, uh, revenue growth will be much lower than the previous quarter, this quarter, because the prices, corrected price will start reflecting in Jan, Feb, March. Okay, got it. Uh, and the but how would that impact your EBITDA? Uh, impact our? Yeah, we did. We did mention that we had certain sourcing gains because of the reversal of raw material prices. Okay, that also added to our EBITDA uh, per metric ton. So, so the next quarter likely when the revenue normalizes, reflecting the lower RM environment, your EBITDA would come down too, correct? That's what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so what we are saying is that, you know, if there are opportunities available in the market to manage your positions in a way that you're able to get better relations, that's what we will do. Now, as I said, in the next quarter, okay, more important is to prioritize our volume growth. So whether the two things, one is in terms of whether we will be able to get the volume growth with giving price reductions and whether my raw material scenario will allow me to be able to get certain efficiencies. Now, this is something that will have, uh, that we'll be able to say only after the quarter ends because our day-to-day -day way of doing business to ensure that we are able to get a volume growth and manage our RM positions in a way that we are able to get better realization. So that's where I'd like to put it. Okay, so it looks like there are too many moving pieces here, right? Essentially. No, there are. There are. You've already you right. You got it right. You got it right. You got it right. <laughs> okay, my uh, next question is you. I remember in the, some of the earlier con calls, you had mentioned that uh, during the COVID days, that you're seeing a lot of business from the e commerce uh, players, the new e commerce players that have been selling, they started selling consumer goods. Uh, is that still on or was that just a. Yeah, that, uh, that trend continues. I think uh, a number of uh, e commerce players have uh, strengthened themselves, grown pretty well. Uh, there have also been cases where uh, some e commerce players have fallen by the wayside. Okay. So the good guys are uh, getting better and better and growing. Okay, so they would also be a driver for your volume growth, right? Uh, given which will be didn't exist before the COVID, correct? Yeah, yeah, they do offer opportunities for volume growth, but as you know, 
the e-commerce segment is a very very small portion of the overall uh, uh, you know size of the market okay done it yeah. all right thank you very much thank you thank you next question comes on the line of bargoa puddev from kotak mutual funds please go ahead yeah good afternoon team and uh, congrats on a good performance uh, a couple of questions one is uh, what would be the contribution of uh, turkey in terms of uh, the overall revenue uh, uh, huh? turkey will be approximately uh, 9 to 10% of our overall okay okay and that you mentioned uh, you'll come to know the exact uh, assessment only in the next 15 to 20 days yeah yeah because by the way what's happening is that uh, right now when we are we are assessing whether first is whether any of our uh, shipments have got into trouble so we have realized that that's not an issue there and then the second is we are now only talking to all the customers and asking about their well being now the impact on business is we will probably wait right so right time to ask them so we'll assess that probably in the coming uh, days okay yeah but do you think there is a significant risk to this business uh, maybe in fy 24 or too early to assess so i say i don't know if you ask me i uh, uh, i'm not able to comment in terms of whether very very clearly that this will not have any impact but yes uh, the probability looks lower from we need to wait you need there to will be it. some impact uh, but uh, uh, there will be some impact yeah. yeah short term because more in terms of the uh, demand uh, sentiment getting impacted there so which we will see but we don't see it to be prolonged once they start adjusting to the yeah. new normal yeah sure sure and my second question is out of our 1800 odd customers uh, how many of them uh, would still be under ladder 1 um, and um, obviously uh, your endeavor would be to graduate them to ladder 2 ladder 3 etc etc very uh, you are you are right see obviously uh, the the top most step in the ladders takes anywhere between 25 to 30 years okay so this uh, climbing is uh, uh, you know uh, gradual deliberate and uh, uh, compounded and cumulative so a majority of our customers in this 1800 will all be in, in the first step of the ladder okay so as I, as we have already already always mentioned uh, the number of uh, customers in uh, the top uh, the top most step of the ladder you can count on fingers right Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, would it be fair to say that 80 or percent would be ladder one, or or maybe more? Even more. Okay. Even, even more. Even more. Even more. Okay. Yeah. 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 But it's important that we get them into ladder one and keep them there, and then move them to the subsequent ones. So that's also an important job for us to do, which we are doing pretty well. and as they as they move up the ladder obviously the uh, effort increases disproportionately in terms of engagement right you're right obviously also the opportunities uh, increase uh, manifold okay mm. or the engagement increases the opportunity also increases because you are able to uh, you know uh, deal with them a wider package of your products and would it be fair to say that uh, uh, we would have 100% share of them as they move up the ladder or they go to some other um, supplier no 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 uh, normally we have seen that uh, all customers uh, you know in their own uh, risk uh, uh, matrix uh, don't like to have uh, only one supplier uh, in their uh, you know you know procurement they always have uh, uh one more uh, supplier you know supplier uh, to ensure that they fulfill their uh, uh, risk criteria as far as their organization is concerned understood okay yeah. sir thank you thank you for your time and all the best yeah thank you so much thank you next question comes from the line of anubhav shahu from ic sojo please go ahead Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, couple of questions. One 
uh, one is on uh, you comment on the uh, benefit arising out of sourcing gain uh, from due to reversal in uh, prompted prices so when you mention that uh, uh, do you mean to say that you could get some better deals in getting some of the input prices uh, which is uh, otherwise in the normal course of operation we don't do is that the case no no see it's a question it's of a combination of many things okay it also the way we manage our procurement which we have said is uh, is is an area which we are very very particular about and careful about uh, given that the raw materials are highly uh, uh, you know subject to ups and downs right yeah okay okay and um, uh, is there a way we can you can quantify this benefit which happened this quarter which otherwise is not a normal course of operation no uh, that we will not be able to uh, comment upon anubhav okay 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 uh, uh, thanks uh, and, and so you did mention about the channel inventory and i think the inventory at the customer at the us operation probably is on the higher side uh, i had a question regarding our position on our own inventory I mean, it looks like as far the result uh, for Q3 is concerned, uh, we probably were not impact much on high cost inventory. Uh, how, how do you see this thing? Uh, are we past that challenge? Because there has been a uh, quite a good uh, climb down of uh, you know the fatty alcohol prices and all. Uh, right. So, uh, so how are we positioned as far the high cost inventory is concerned? You know, so we, are, we we ensure that we are always uh, flowing in line with the market. so they it will start reflecting uh, the buying prices will start reflecting in terms of the lower prices as the months move on but as i said did answer a question earlier that the prices will not start to be immediately the alcohol prices start correcting say uh, four months back it again went up it again has come down so it's a it's a combination so you'll see a directional trend in terms of my raw material inventory prices coming down very clearly okay. Yeah, 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 you will see my price. Jan, Feb, March will be lower than what it was October, November, December. Logically, because the corrections majorly started in uh, uh, June, July, came down again, went up, it's come down again. So we'll see that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, quite clear. Thanks a lot for this. Yeah. Thank you. Next question comes on the line of Malay Samir from Breakthroughs in Stock Market. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh uh sir you've been uh, uh sharing with us that uh the abita margin will lead the volume growth we can say the abita in absolute term will grow much more than the volumes and on the other side you're sharing with us that you will sacrifice the pricing uh for the volume growth so Aren't these two statements contradictory? We didn't say any of those things. I tell you, what we said was volume growth is the priority, and then if the market affords us, we tell us clearly that there's a volume growth possible with the judicious price uh, uh, pricing approach. We'll do that because that is what is important. If the market uh, tells us that there is no possibility of a volume growth, then it's uh, our job to ensure that we get the right pricing. So that's how we have to manage. But finally, we said that we need to grow our volumes ahead of the market, grow our EBITDA ahead of the volume growth, growth, and the fat ahead of the EBITDA growth. That's what we said. So, if we were to take a scenario where the volume um, does not grow hypothetically in FY24, right? Then your EBITDA in FY24 will be lower than FY23 because. Volume is the priority and not the pricing. So I did tell you that finally the bit of a meeting is a derivative of how uh, the macro economic situation is, and how we ensure that we are able to grow our volumes. What we are clearly telling because we do not know what the situation in terms of demand is going to be six nine months from now. If it is going to grow by ten percent, we better ensure that we grow at ten percent minimum. Correct. If that requires us to do judicious price corrections, we need to do that. So, so if if there are challenges on the volume growth, and if we do not get the benefit of export from Egypt like we've got this time, and if volume is uh, uh, the leading uh, focus for us, 
our EBITDA in FY24 could be substantially lower than what it is in this quarter. Uh, not necessary. You very well know. You very well know how EBITDA gets arrived at, right? Revenue minus cost, right? Minus various costs. So how do you manage your cost judiciously? How do you manage your RM position judiciously? How do you manage your pricing appropriately? Uh, some total of all that is how uh, yeah. is the EBITDA per metric done. Right. So various levers are available, correct? So we need to use appropriate levers to be able to deliver uh, profitable growth. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Divyata Dalal from Trident Capital Investment. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, a little bit more on the statement that you made that uh, in terms of performance acceptance, uh, we are able to manage better realization because of the product mix. So one, I would like to understand uh, which are the geographies where you know we are able to uh, get a better product mix. And uh, second, uh, are these trends sustainable? We, uh, first question we cannot answer with geographies. Okay. Uh, that's very clear. Okay. Second question, we want the environment to enable us to sustain that. Okay, but as I said earlier, okay, we're not going to be, if, uh, it requires uh, that uh, we uh, need to price it appropriately to gain volumes. If the market allows us an opportunity, we'll do that. So that will be the answer, but we can't make any such specific statement on that right now. Okay, no, no my question was more pertaining to, uh, see, since we've seen that the India market is also growing well. So are you seeing a structural change where, uh, you know, the mass, uh, the, in the product mix where the, mass or lower realization products are, you know, lesser as compared to people moving towards premium oh, products see, like this. this uh, kindly note that the product <coughs> that we talk about is always uh, uh, what has happened. We are only telling you what has happened. But our effort is always to grow in all categories in all in, and in all segments. Okay? Now what has happened is that in the last year because of uh, the highly inflationary pressures, okay? mm -hmm. the market, let us say, chooses to chooses you know, certain product categories vis a vis certain other product categories. This can, of course, change once normalization happens. Okay? And our job is to respond to this market and respond to these opportunities. Okay, so uh, we mean to say that this is uh, uh, not a normal situation and probably once normalization happens... Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. See. You know, kindly note that, you know, we don't design our uh, business on the basis of EBITDA per metric ton. Right, right. See, right. EBITDA, no, I EBITDA per metric ton is always a derivative. Derivative. No, I completely understand that. My uh, question was just to understand the trends in the market, whether uh, uh, in performance acceptance, whether the demand is such that it is moving towards more premiumization product as compared to a mass product. I just wanted to understand the trend in the market. Nothing, yeah. nothing says trend is... Uh, no. So, obviously, market. what is important to understand is that uh, all markets are a combination of mass, mastige, and you know, prestige. Uh, yeah. What we mean by premium, okay? Now, particularly in the last year, there was a significant impact with respect to the prestige uh, products, which, uh, you know, in a way reflected in uh, the decline of, you know, specialty products as far as last year is concerned, okay? Now, uh, again, uh, as far as these markets, which have had an impact because of inflation in terms of the volume, our customers very obviously rejig their particular portfolio to ensure that they respond to the ultimate consumer's requirement and demand and need, okay? They accordingly calibrate their own offerings. Uh, to give one example, uh, you would have seen some of our uh, multinational customers saying that uh, customers in the last year preferred a lot of smaller packs. They, you know, they prefer to buy a lot of smaller packs because of the inflationary situation. In which case, the entire, uh, you know, a mix of offering that they offer differs from you know from previous however they may they may play play a different tune when the situation comes back to normal okay so these are the sort of you know changes which happen in the market and our job is to fundamentally respond to these changes with agility and with you know uh, you know ensuring 
that uh, we are able to meet our service requirements of our customers very very promptly and properly got it sir got it got it all right and one bookkeeping question on the capex what is the capex that we have planned for uh, fy24 and what capex have we done to nine months of fy23 you said that, you know we are uh, we uh, we have always indicated that our capex per year approximately will be 150 crores uh, and uh, you know it would be there even for the next maybe 2 to 3 years or so This year we have already crossed about 120 crores in the nine months. Yeah, we have already crossed 120 crores in the nine months. Okay, fine. All right, that's it from my side. Thank you and all the best, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Dinesh Patak from Yato Asset Management. Please go ahead. Sorry, this is Dinesh Patak from Vitook Asset Management. Uh, sir. Uh, what is your market share in the covered category and the geographies maybe you can take one by one like india no, we would uh, not be talking about uh, uh, these numbers we don't talk about we don't talk yes. about these numbers yeah, yeah. No, so what i want to understand is that you said that we will grow volume ahead of the market but yeah. market like you know from my understanding there would be various markets where you are not present in like are you like nurturing new markets can you talk a little bit about that no in the various you know, we are we are already present in about 76 to 80 countries what we are saying is that in terms of the products that we operate in those particular countries or geographies and with respect to those particular products we grow ahead of the market hmm yeah okay uh, in when you said turkey is 10% of the revenue this is total revenue or just emet revenue total total revenue total revenue okay yeah. um sir uh, this uh, uh, laurel alcohol would be what percentage of your uh, raw material buying it's about 6 over 60% of our raw material buying okay uh this is this is important only for performance uh, and in specialty there is not much laurel alcohol right yeah there will be not much of laurel alcohol in performance pro- in, uh, in specialty products yeah okay uh uh how much of the like uh, tonnage is exported from india uh, where you uh, and how do you account for the freight you book it both in revenue as well as in other expenses freight are you No, I didn't. We didn't understand. What is yeah. the question? So, uh, how much of the how much of the tonnage that you sell every year is exported from India, and also let's say exported from the uh, the plant that you have in Egypt? Uh, and the international the, customer, the, international sales constitute approximately two thirds of our total sales. Okay. So, uh, as far as uh, uh, India is concerned, uh, what? what Revenue, no, export. 50-50, approximately. Approximately 50-50. So what you produce in India, 50 you consume in India, sell in India, and 50 you sell abroad, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. For the 50 that you sell abroad, export, you, uh, like raw material, I have an understanding of your pass-throughs with some of the clients. For freight, if you can explain this 50% of which is exported from India, how is freight accounted for, and is it pass-through? Uh, what is the you know? Exposure to no, freight no, no, like uh, volatility. It's not, it's not as simple as that because finally freight uh, was still uh, last year the way it went up was a very small component of the overall pricing. So typically freight moves with uh, there are some places where we do a three month freight contracts for customers. Uh, we we have some places where we do a six month contracts. It's not uh, one says fits uh, all sort of a situation. So the objective is to ensure that we take the right service, deliver volumes, uh, uh, customer schedules very well on time. And then ensure that you buy the right uh, price, uh, the freight. But that's how it is worked out. So there is nothing where uh, we uh, try to manage your freight positions in a very different way. Okay. Uh, what would be our capacity utilization? Here? Approximately 66, 67. 67. It can go up to maximum of what? We normally, when it goes, uh, when it almost nears 80 to 85, we start thinking about increasing the capacity further. So the capex that you are doing 150 crore a year, this is just maintenance uh, capex. There is no growth. So it's a combination, of maintenance. combination of maintenance As plus well growth. growth. Okay. 
how much capacity are you adding if you can just like talk about that as well yeah, yeah, you know, the competition of what we do in both performance and speciality so we, we typically would not be able to comment on that okay okay thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you due to time constraints we have reached the end of question and answer session i would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments thank you thank you very much thank you ladies and gentlemen uh thank you for your presence have a uh, good day and and see you in the next quarter thank you all thank you on behalf of galaxy surfactant limited that concludes this conference thank you for joining us you may now disconnect your lines